Hi, my name is Tolulala Olumide and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Tolulola Olumide holds a bachelor's degree in business administration as well as a jury's doctor law degree. In addition to practicing administrative law for a few years in her capacity as a legal auditor for the U.S. Department of Labor, she has garnered a wealth of experience working in different industries over the years. She is currently the executive director for the Funtuna lifestyle brand at Funtuna Ventures, a subsidiary of Animal Care Services Nigeria Limited, where she spearheads the corporate strategy and manages the brand identity of the firm within the industry, with the ultimate goal of maximizing customer perception. So welcome to Under 40 CEOs, Tolu. Thank you, Fab. Good to be here. All right. Amazing. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, you attended the University of Georgia, where you... Georgia State University. Georgia State University. Yes where you bagged your first degree in business administration. Yes. Uh, and subsequently, Virginia. Yes, where went you, to law school. You, took, you went to law school. Yes. Um, but tell me uh, about, you know, your pre-teen years, growing up in Lagos. Uh, what, was those, what were those years like? Um, they were pretty basic, I think. I mean, I think I had a, a pretty standard childhood. You know, um, siblings, two parents in the house, thank God. Um, I grew up um, raised as a Christian. And um, went to church every Sunday, like uh, most of my friends that I knew, or most of the people that I knew. And um, uh, we just had a, a pretty good childhood. You know, things were different back then than they are now, obviously. We got to play outside. <laughs> we didn't have as much video games, as much screen time. Um, TV was, was on a schedule that you didn't dictate. It was whatever NTA was giving you or, you know, if you had cable. Um, so we, we had a pretty basic, happy childhood, I, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. Yeah. So you went to school, uh, primary school in Lagos? Yes, right. I went to Chrisland. Chrisland okay. Nursery Primary School. And yeah. then secondary school? So um, I attended Atlantic Hall for sec my first couple of years of secondary school. Mm -hmm. And uh, by just three, I was at Federal Government Girls College, Akure. Um, it was a, there's a funny story <laughs> attached to that. Um, during yeah. one of our... Um, Sunday breaks um, during study time or something in, on Sunday in Atlantic Hall in the boarding house. My mom came with two of her friends to visit one of their unannounced visits. It wasn't a visiting day or anything. She just came in the evening. And she came at a time when they were handing us our laundry, oh. you know, which had just been dry cleaned. Okay. So they're calling us one by one and handing over our clothes to us. And her and her friends are looking around puzzled. And my mom's like, what about the bucket and the soap that I bought for this child? You know, they're actually doing their laundry for them. And, you know, some of these things that they might have known, seen in the prospectus at the time, and it seemed very cool. But I think at that point, she felt like, no, this isn't the way that I want my child to be raised. I want her to be washing her own clothes and be doing some of the things that we went to boarding house to do, you know, being her. So I think that day I had one leg out of, of Atlantic Hall. <laughs> and I think by the next term, I was at uh, a federal government school. Where you did a lot more washing. washing. my clothes, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, tell me about your time but, and the transition. Um, how easy was it for you to adapt to, to the change? It was pretty hard. Okay. And I, I wouldn't say it was because of the labor. It was just because um, I missed home. You know, it was just because I missed home and I was in a different environment. And um, I was pretty coddled, even, in, even when I went to Akure, because I had so many seniors who protected me and, you know, just wanted to make sure I was fine. So I didn't suffer, but I was that kind of person who was just so emotional. And I missed being close to home and being, you know, easily accessed by my parents who would come in, you know, every week or whenever they wanted to see me at school. So um, I, I was the student who cried every day. Aww. Up until, even when, I, <laughs> even when I was in senior school, I, I would still get to school and be like, oh, God, we're back at school, and I would cry. Funny enough, I loved Akure. I made some of my best friends there. I had some of my mm. best memories there. But it took me a while to settle down each time I would go to school. 
Wow. And um, yeah, so I was, I was just one of those people who didn't like change. Hmm. So from every you know holiday, getting back to school, there was that transition that took a while for me to adjust to. But you know, ultimately, it was it was a very very good experience. Wow. Very so good. you you didn't enjoy change. But change continued to happen to you because you didn't even finish the um, secondary school in Akure. No, I didn't. Before you got, you know, moved to the United States. Yeah. What happened at that time? So um, my sister had graduated um, and we were very close in age. And my mom just felt if she's going to the U.S., I wouldn't want her to go by herself. So I was basically an escort for my sister oh. going to the U.S. <laughs> and um, so... We went back, we were, and we got into the school system there. Um, mm. She went into the 12th grade, I went into the 11th grade. And um, it helped us to assimilate better into the system there. And so... Okay, but then there must have been a sort of culture shock. Oh, yes. Um, yes, there definitely was. That. There definitely <laughs> was. I, I realized I was a black person when I got to the United States. You know, I, of course, in Nigeria, just a Nigerian. But when you are in a place where there's diversity, then you realize that, oh, OK, so I'm, this is my category. And because I, I went into, we moved to New Mexico when we moved to the States. So it wasn't even just black and white. We were right there in the heart of like a Hispanic community. And, and, and it was so different. But it was wonderful because Hispanics are so friendly, very friendly, very embracing. And so it was actually a very good experience because um, people recognized us as outsiders but it wasn't like oh we're turning our backs on them it was let's embrace them let's make them mm -hmm. comfortable so that was the experience that i had um i think the first few months that i got to the states um shortly after that we moved to georgia atlanta where there were a lot more black people and um, i would say that's probably where the real culture shock started because um uh you find out that there are different blacks so we are africans and <laughs> and then there are, you know, the African-Americans. And so you had to marry the two cultures and, and, and start to learn again, you know, who you were. And because it was our formative years, I was 14 at the time, turned 15. It was a very crucial time of my life. And so I, I, it, was, it was definitely a great time of learning and coming into myself. Amazing. So, and, and I think that period yeah. obviously helped you with the university life Absolutely. in college. Um, tell me about your first you know, year yeah. in college? Oh, first year of college was interesting. It was, um, it was interesting because, thank God, when we got to school, um, Atlanta is, is diverse. Mm. And at the same time, it has a very, very strong Nigerian community. So we had African Students Association. So it made it that much easier to assimilate. Oh. And you had so many Nigerians, it made it that much easier to assimilate. So it was like you were in a Nigerian environment within a larger, diverse environment. And um, so it was, it was a very easy assimilation, I think. And, you know, just um, learning to be more responsible, learning to be disciplined, making your own decisions because nobody's there telling you to turn in your homework by this time or make sure this is done or go to bed early so you wake up early, you know. So you, those are those, the years where you really have to become a more disciplined person and take responsibility for your autonomy. And um, you mm -hmm. can actually make some poor choices then when mm -hmm. you're left to yourself. But I thank mm -hmm. God because we were raised well and we always had that drumbeat in our minds, you know, remember the child of who you are. Mm -hmm. we, we did not deviate from, you know, what was expected from us. Tolu started to take responsibility for our autonomy in college in the United States. But what were the series of events that led her to choose a course of study in the first place? Talking about choices, how did you make the choice uh, to study business administration? Um, honestly, I feel like it was probably the most, the easiest thing to do at the time. You know, I, I was, I think I always felt like I was going to go to law school. I was always told that you should be a lawyer because of the way I spoke. And so in, in America, I was telling you earlier, um, as long as you have uh, good grades in whatever first degree you take, be it, you know, engineering or basket mm -hmm. weaving, like I said, you could, you know, take your LSAT and get into a decent law school. So it didn't really matter what my first degree was because I always felt like I was going to go on to get a master's degree in law. So for me, business administration just felt like that catch-all degree that I could use for anything. You know, it was a safety net 
And um, so that was how I made that choice. And yeah. then off to Virginia you went for law. Yes, I actually had about two years in between. After so what, what, were you, what were you doing in those two years? I was working. I, I used my first, I, I was able to get a job. Like I said, it was an easy degree to have because, mm. you know, most people are like, okay, I guess this is a good enough degree. Come in and, mm. you know, work with this business, right? So I was able, I worked at a, um, an asset management company for two years. And then while I was there, I took the LSAT and just prepared and... and decided it was time to go to law school. So, so how was law school? Law school was interesting because um, uh, I probably was one of a few students who, in the first year of law school, started reading books of what to do with a law degree if you don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so in my, first, in my first year, I'd already had a change of heart. Oh, wow. I was like, yeah, I'm not too keen on this law thing. But mm. I mean, I, I, my, my heart was in the studies. I knew that if I got a degree, I could definitely use it because there's so many things you can do with a law degree. So of course I pushed through, but I, I, at some point I realized that the courtroom wasn't for me, you know, so. Mm. But it was still a very good experience because it's another level of discipline and, and self, you know, um, responsibility. You have mm. to take responsibility for yourself and make good decisions, quality decisions. Mm. And so I think it helped me for that. Yeah. Well, I, w I would think that, um commercially and running a business, I mean, having a law degree would um, actually have some impact. What are those things that you think that you took from law school um, that you're actively utilizing today? Attention to detail. Ah. So the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no kind of business you do where there isn't a requirement to understand the nitty gritty. And I know that that is definitely one of those things that um, law school helped me to develop that attention to detail. Of course, um, syntax, prose, grammar, speaking well, presenting yourself well, mm -hmm. it also helped me with that. And All right. So, yeah. so I actually watched you sign a couple of documents earlier today, and I noticed you, you went through each and every one of those, exactly. the lines before you signed off right. on it. Um, a lot of people wouldn't. Oh, what's in there? All right, yeah. sign, and yeah. that's signed. So I, I saw that, you know, come to play. Um, so you were done with law school, and then what happened afterwards? So after law school, yeah. I, um, I got a job. What year was this, please? This was in 2007. Okay. I graduated from law school. Yes. So I got a job at the U.S. Department of Labor okay. as, a, as a, an administrative lawyer, as an auditor. Um, so what I did was um, we helped to administer certain um, health insurance related laws. We, mm. we, we, were, we helped to regulate those laws and make sure that they were being followed by companies. And so we did audits and we had, um, we were more of the administrative angle and we had the legal department okay. that we would, um, we would make our findings, do our investigations, do our audits, and then we would turn it over to the solicitor's office, which was our sister office in the same in the same department. So what we did was more of like the background investigatory work, okay. but all of us were required to be, you know, to have our law degrees and, you know, have like a legal background. So, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And at some point um, after this, you moved to Nigeria. Yes, I did. What informed your, your move back to Nigeria? Hmm. <laughs> Should I say it plainly? <laughs> ah, it's yes, a man. Please. I followed the man. <laughs> Yeah, I met my husband a couple of years before um, uh, before I moved, and you know, the relationship took off, and you know, he made me a proposal that I could not refuse, and so I said, okay, this is worth considering, and you know, I moved back to Nigeria, and there was a lot of reasons to come back home. It was it was getting to be time. That was always the plan that we would come back home and, you know, join the family business. So the time was right. Everything worked together. So. So you came back home but you did not join the family business. Yes. So right. you got married and then? So in 2010, um, I moved, actually 2009, I moved back home. And um, before I joined the family business, I dabbled a little bit um, just to get some experience externally before coming into the, the you know, home front. And I worked at a fashion house briefly for maybe about nine months. Um, just um, doing more administrative work because I had some experience in HR I had some experience, of course, with my legal um, and just helped to manage the office, helped to do kind of like the, the, the behind the scenes stuff, um, housekeeping. And um, after that, I worked a little bit at a, um, an ups, uh, a startup, um, a um, communication startup. Mm -hmm. And um, we also, I did basically the same thing. So more of legal interfacing and um, housekeeping, HR, and just office management. 
And um, after that, I got pregnant and I was indisposed for about a year. So I, I you know, didn't do anything at that time. But after maybe my baby was about a year old, almost a year old, I started the family business. So. All right. So talking about the family business, uh, I know there's some rich history behind it. Uh, do you want to let us into, into a little bit of that? What year was it launched and how was it launched? Okay, so um, Animal Care Services Consult started um, officially in 1979. It launched as OA and OA Associates. It was started by my parents. And um, it started, like I said, in 1979, so it's 42 years old this year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically their first child. <laughs> and um, the business is um, a Greek livestock, yeah. mostly livestock facing. Uh, we produce um, medicaments and um, feeds. Um, obviously, we have a poultry farm. Um, we do extension services for farmers. Um, just, just, a, just a lot of things under the Greek and livestock umbrella. We mm -hmm. also have training facilities where we help to train other farmers. So over the years, the company has, has grown and um, to, to be what it is right now, encapsulating so many different subdivisions and subsets. So what year was it when you, you joined uh, Animal Care? Yes. Um, and in what capacity? So I joined Animal Care in 2012. And um, I honestly don't remember what my title was, but um, I came in um, obviously at a much lower level than I am now because the intention was always to amass as much experience as I could from every department. So um, there's no question I was an understudy. I came in knowing that I was going to have quite a bit of responsibility on my shoulder. So at every point in every department that I was, I, I took in the information and the knowledge, um, knowing that uh, you know, this was more about developing me to you know, the position that I am now and you know, possibly something more later. So, um, I started with the eggs. Um, eggs has always basically been my baby. And um, I started with more or less like the PR brand managing um, area of it. Um, we would go into supermarkets, first of all, making sure that we were placed on shelves. So we had you know, a lot of supermarkets that were already um, collecting the product, but we wanted to make sure that they were satisfied. So I did a lot of behind the scenes in collating information, doing questionnaires, just finding what our position was in the minds of um, our outlets. And of course, ultimately in the minds of the vendors, I mean, the um, consumers as well. So we did a lot of that. We were able to find our footing there, make sure that we were established. We corrected some errors that had developed along the way um, and just stabilized things there. And then after that, I started to face more of the brand. And um, so we had just rebranded maybe a couple of years before that. And I felt like we needed to utilize that brand face better than we were, wanted to maximize it. And so we started developing different things. Um, we went into social media, which we hadn't been in before, and um, basically just started drawing attention to ourselves. We were doing more um, activities with supermarkets. We would have jamborees, which we called them at the time, um, every quarter which we would go to a supermarket, um, a couple of supermarkets sometimes in the course of a weekend. And um, essentially we would um, have giveaways of maybe egg samples. We would give away merchandise like t-shirts, keychains. What we were doing with that was trying to put ourselves in the hands of the consumer directly so that they identified with us. So if you have a Funtuna shirt at home, most likely when you get to the store, you would be more inclined to pick up a Funtuna egg as opposed mm -hmm. to the other brands. You know, if you have a Fontuna key holder on your car keys, you know, when you go, so it was just about identifying with the brand. And mm -hmm. we did a lot of that. And I think we were able to get a lot of consumers on our side, besides the fact that we have quality eggs, but we just wanted to do the Coca-Cola thing by just constantly staying top of mind. Um, so we did, we did quite a bit of that. Um, we started, we actually developed a cookbook which we also gave away. A lot of people loved it and we still have it. We still give it away at our World Egg Day events and our jamborees. And so basically that was part of the platform that I helped to, to develop at the mm -hmm. time. And we're building on it. We still keep building on it. Um, and um, a few years ago, about three or four years ago, we started our water brand, 
And so I transitioned from the egg business into the water business, um, which has more or less kind of been my baby. And um, despite the hardships in this particular industry, um, it, it's like we transitioned from uh, a, blue, a blue ocean into a red ocean, um, you know, where we didn't have much competition with the eggs. We do have competition, but we started what we're doing. So when you have that pioneer um, benefit or advantage, as long as you're making good choices and good decisions, you are able to maintain it. And we've been trying to do that. It's been a struggle because people are coming up and doing very well as well, making good decisions as well. But we always try to stay ahead. So with the eggs, we've had the benefit and the advantage of the pioneer status mm -hmm. of egg branding, egg packaging. We were the first to ever do it. Um, with water, you come into an industry that is saturated, you know, and um, people say water is water. Um, and the truth is our water is not just water. We, we, we have a whole process that produces a water that is so crisp and so clean and so fresh and pure tasting that honestly, I can't tell you how many times we've had people saying, we want your water at this event. Where can we find your water? We're constantly getting emails, you know, people who taste the water at an event or somewhere and say, I can't find it in the stores. Where is it? So the taste is, is it's, it's there, you know, like I said, the devil is in the details. The taste of our water is so crisp and so refreshing that um, it's not just your everyday water, but we can't, how do you market that? How do you sell that? You know, people are used to what they're used to. The price determines a lot of decisions. And when you're in, a, in, a, in an industry that is so saturated with so many compet uh, you know, competition, so much competition, what we've been trying to do is just distinguish ourselves. And what we've done, I think, successfully is um, with our three liters, our Funtuna three liters water, um, we have a lot of work to do in expanding the brand, in you know, making sure that we position ourselves on many shelves. We're still doing a lot of work in the background. Um, the economy has been quite difficult. It's been tough. The materials that you're buying, um, every day everything gets more expensive. Every day, you know, your, comp your competition is, is going out of business, you know. So the market has been hard, but we're staying in because we know what we're trying to offer. And with the three liter water, what we're selling is 24 hours of refreshment. It's, this is your 24 hour water, three liters a day for optimal health. And um, that's, that's really what the doctor recommends, mm -hmm. two to three mm -hmm. liters a day of water. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've made it convenient by packaging that three liters in one you know, bottle so that you know that I start my day with this and I finish with this and I know I've gotten in my three liters for the day. So that's the, the, the particular SKU that we are using to distinguish ourselves in this red ocean. And um, by the grace of God, we plan to do more with it. We're not anywhere near close to cutting our teeth on it yet, but we're doing, we're, we have plans. We're here to stay. So people should look out for Funtuna Water anywhere they can find it. And we will make sure that it is in supermarkets and neighborhood stores near you as soon as possible. Hi, my name is Tolulala Olumide, and you too can be an under 40 CEO.